Just a quick FYI, I, uh, I was introduced to a new phrase just now, hot off the presses. I think this is the newest, trendiest phrase on the left. Um, here it is, okay, non-consensual puberty. Yes, yes, non-consensual puberty. This apparently refers to when, like, a, uh, a trans boy is forced to go through puberty against his will, which makes him even more apparently male, which he doesn't want to be. So that's, that's non-consensual uh, uh, puberty, which, which honestly, I can, you know, I can relate to that. I mean, I, I am experiencing right now non-consensual aging, and eventually I will non-consensually die. So it, is, uh, it can be a very, very tough thing. Um, so lo look out for that. You're going to be hearing that more and more, uh, especially if you happen to go to college, which I don't recommend. Anyway, um, this is kind of related, actually. Let's talk about let's talk about Gillette, um, the best a man can get, supposedly, which which was always a questionable slogan because men really shouldn't be shaving at all. Uh, as you could, I don't know a lot about G Gillette, as you can tell, um, and as if to drive that point home, you know, as if Gillette wanted to drive home the point that you know what, don't use our product, don't shave. They came out with an ad, if you can call it an ad which encourages men to shave off their toxic masculinity um, and to, uh, you know, to stop being generally so horrible. Um, you see, men, men really haven't been lectured and scolded and sermonized to enough, so Gillette decided they were going to get in on the act. I think the, the people at Gillette, the, the advertising you know, folks there, they sat around and they said, um, okay, we're trying to sell razors, we're trying to sell shaving cream. How can we get more men to buy this stuff? And then they all kind of looked at each other and they said, we need to tell them that they're awful. And uh, yeah, you know what they need? A homily. That's what they need. They need a homily. And everyone, they all nodded in agreement and they said, let's do it. Brilliant. Uh, I should mention, by the way, that all of the, in this, in this scenario, all of the advertising people at Gillette, they are all um, college-aged feminists, apparently. And, and so this is the, the um, ad they came up with. Um, and it is a, it's being hailed as wonderful and inspiring, mostly by, by liberals. Feminists, of course, love it. As I said, I think feminists probably are the ones who came up with this. And when feminists love an ad that's supposedly made for men, you know that something's wrong. So let's, um, let's take a look. Here, here's the ad right now. Bullying. The Me the Too movement against sexual toxic harassment. Masculinity. Is this the best a man can get? Is it? We can't hide from it. Sexual harassment is taking over. It's been going on far too long. We can't laugh it off. Who's the daddy? What I actually think she's trying to say making the same old excuses boys will be boys boys will be boys boys will be boys but something boys. finally changed allegations regarding sexual assault and sexual harassment once but she says and there will be no going back because we we believe in the best in men men need to hold other men accountable smile sweetie come on to say the right thing, to act the right uh, way. Bro, not cool, not cool. Some already are. In ways big Yo, men, and small. I am strong. I am strong. But some is not enough. It's not how we treat each other, okay? Okay. Because the boys watching today will be the men of tomorrow. Okay. So, a few things here. First of all, the ad says, and I, I know that, you know, there are a lot of, as I said, a lot of feminists, and, and I've seen plenty of women, not just women, but, but also liberal men on social media who are saying, well, what's the problem with this thing? You know, it seems, seems fine to me. What's, it's, it's, it's inspiring, right? What's, what's wrong with inspiring men? Well, there's a lot wrong with it, and I'm going to try to explain it to you now. Um, first, 
the ad says that something changed, okay? And there's no going back. And then as soon as it says that, then we see all these scenes of men doing normal, decent things, like breaking up fights between kids, um, ref uh, refraining from sexually harassing women. And the thing that's supposed to be the catalyst, um, the thing that supposedly changed everything and made men see the error in their ways is the Me Too movement, right? The Me Too movement. And you hear this all the time that the Me Too movement came along and made men look at themselves and rethink things and come to realizations and have epiphanies. This is also a lot of the men who were caught up in the Me Too movement, a lot of the Hollywood celebrities who were, who were um, exposed as perverts, when they came out with their inevitable apologies, they would always have a line like this. They would say, well, you know, the Me Too movement, I think it's made all men um, think, think of things differently now, you know? He's, 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 so you see these guys, they're trying to make it not just about them, it's really all men. This is insulting and degrading. And if you can't see why it's insulting and degrading, then I, I don't even know if there's any way for me to explain it to you. It should be self-evident why this is insulting and degrading. The vast majority of men do not need and did not ever need the Me Too movement to tell them not to rape women or to harass women. Okay? Um, the Me Too movement came about because perverts in Hollywood were being perverts, were being, were being jerks, or worse. Um, most of us didn't learn anything from that because we already knew it. So, and no, no, I'll tell you right now, I did not learn a single thing from the Me Too movement. I learned nothing from it. Harvey Weinstein, uh, Kevin Spacey, all these guys, uh, Bill Cosby, I didn't learn anything from that. I learned absolutely nothing because I already knew all of that. So there wasn't any point where I was sitting down and watching a news report about Harvey Weinstein and, and I went, oh man, oh, so we're not supposed to do that? Oh, okay. Whew, all right. No, I, that never happened for me. I never had that moment. Um, probably 95% of all the men in the world never had that moment because we already knew that. And in fact, the thing is, I would say actually 100% of men in the world never had that moment because even the men who do those things already knew that they weren't supposed to do it. It's not like they were confused about it. That's one of the problems with this ridiculous thing you hear from feminists about, um, well, we need to teach boys not to rape. Let's teach boys not to teach them not to rape. What do you really think that you need to sit down and say to boys, Hey, listen, don't rape people. I mean, do you, are you going to sit them down and say, Hey, listen, don't be serial killers. Okay. I want you to listen very closely to me right now. Listen, listen to what I'm saying. Do not rob banks. Don't do it. No, you, you don't need to ever say that to really anyone explicitly. And I know you'll say, well, people do those things. Yeah, they do them, but they know they're not supposed to do them. Yet they do them anyway. You know why? Because there are evil people in the world who know that things are evil and yet do those evil things anyway because there's something else that they want. Okay, so an evil person will say, I'm going to rob the bank anyway because I know I'm not supposed to do it. Yes, but I really want the money. Or a very evil person will say, I know I'm not supposed to rape, but I'm going to do it anyway um, because that's I'm going to fulfill this dark and depraved desire. So it's this. it was never a matter of confusion. All right, that's a very important point here. Um, second, again, the majority of men um, will already do this. So, so think of the, the, in that ad, the sort of virtuous, courageous things that they show men doing. Breaking up fights, uh, stopping bullying, refraining from sexually harassing. The majority of men will already do that. That's how the majority of men already act. Now, the ad says some men do these things. Which, think of how insulting that is. So they're showing these really basic, decent things. And they're showing human beings just acting like human beings. And then the ad says, well, sure, some men already do these things. Some? 
In fact, the ad twice gives this example of a grown man breaking up a fight between kids, and it portrays this as some sort of, in fact, I think it gives that example three times, actually. And it portrays this as some sort of rare example of, of manly courage, except almost every adult man I've ever met in my life would do that. And if you're walking down the street and you see some, some kid getting beat up by a bunch of other kids getting picked on, of course you're going to step in. What, I, the people who made Gillette, do they think that most men are really going to stand by and watch it happen and say, yeah, get him, bully him, do some more bullying. Yes, we love bullying. Uh, really, I, the people who made this ad, I'm not sure if they've ever met a man in their life. Which is kind of concerning considering they make razor blades for a living. Now, unless the fight is actually just a couple of kids roughhousing and playing around and having a good time, which, yes, boys ought to be able to do that, because, yes, boys will be boys. In one of the scenes of the ad, we see a man, um, and this is supposed to be an inspiring moment, a man runs in, he's at a barbecue, he runs in, he swoops in, because two little boys are kind of like rolling around in the grass, and they appear to both be sort of smiling. And so this man, he's, he, he, he runs, you know, he's, he's at the grill and he drops, he's, he runs over and stops them and separates them and says, oh, that's not how we treat each other, okay? No, see, yeah, there, that, that's where most men, or I would hope anyway, if they see a couple of kids roughhousing out in the grass, they're outside, yeah, you're going to let them do that because it's not a big deal. That's, that's how boys like to play. When my son gets together with his little cousin, who's, they're about the same age, I mean, you, they just beat the crap out of each other. I mean, they, they just, they're like a couple of, um, they're like a couple of like rabid raccoons um, going at each other, but it's, they're having fun. It's, it's a, it, that's just how boys play, right? If it gets really dangerous or something, or if they're about to break something, then we'll, we'll stop them. But, uh, but otherwise, you, 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 you let boys do that. Because actually, boys will be boys is in fact a really important piece of wisdom. Um, it, it, boys will be boys is not a slogan of toxic masculinity. It may be a cliche, but like many cliches, it contains some very crucial insights. Um, I, you know what? I'm not sure, aside from in ads like this or in movies or TV shows, I'm not sure if I've ever heard anyone sincerely offer boys will be boys as an excuse for actually bad behavior. Like, I've, I really, I've, I've never heard anyone say when we're talking about rape or actual bullying or anything like that. I've never heard someone say, well, you know, boys will be boys. That, that's, that, that's not real. It's not a thing. Nobody says that. In any situation I've been in where, where this phrase boys will be boys or something like it comes up, it's when we're talking about things that boys should be able to do. Boys do have aggression. They have energy. They, you know, they have they have creativity. Um, they need to be able. They need an outlet for these things. And you can't constantly be stifling and suppressing all of that, because you do need boys to be boys. And this is something that parents of boys need to understand. And I feel really, I feel very sorry for boys who have parents who think that boys will be boys is some sort of horrible phrase that excuses terrible evil. I feel very sorry for boys with parents like that because those are boys who are not going to be allowed to be boys. And if you're not allowing your boy to be a boy, then what are you doing? You're forcing your boy to act like a girl. And that is not fair. You let your girl act like a girl, don't you? Um, Third thing, can just imagine for a moment a similar ad, but for women. Well, you can't imagine it because no such ad would ever be made. <laughs> no such ad could ever possibly exist. Um, can you imagine an ad that said, that said, some women act, act right? You know, some, some women act the right way. Can you imagine an ad like that? Can you imagine an ad that showed, up, it showed various scenes of women acting horribly, and then it allows at the end a concession, some women act the right way. And this is an ad for like Dove body wash or something like that. 
Um, or it's, uh, I don't know, a, you know, a tampon commercial. I mean, can, can you Im imagine an ad like that? It, it couldn't, because you know what would happen? Feminists would literally be rioting in the streets. They would be burning the product in the street. They'd be making like Molotov cocktails out of it and tossing it in people's windows. I mean, they, th that's how upset they would be at an ad like that. At an ad that degraded and demeaned and insulted women like that and talked down to them and insinuated that most women don't know how to behave like decent human beings. Can you imagine an ad that used the phrase toxic femininity? Can you imagine anyone using that phrase? Toxic femininity? What if I were to start using it? What if I were to start uh, talking about toxic femininity? Um, toxic femininity, that's, that's when women uh, gossip maliciously about each other or when women um, shop, uh, spend too much money, too much of their money on clothing, um, or when a woman acts just mean and nasty to a man that's just trying to talk to her and make conversation. I mean, these kinds of things happen all the time in society. Women act like that all the time. I'm not going to say most women do, but that certainly happens. We've all encountered women like that, haven't we? Just like we've encountered men who are jerks. Yet you're not allowed to call that toxic femininity, are you? And I would never actually use that phrase because, I, because that's not femininity. Femininity is a good thing. There is no toxic femininity, just like there's no toxic masculinity. There are men who act the wrong way. There are women who act the, the wrong way. But the women who act the wrong way, it's not because they're being too feminine. Most of the time, it's precisely the opposite, just like with the men. It's not that they're being too masculine. Most of the time, the problem is exactly the opposite of that. Um, but this, and, and by the way, when it comes to like fights and things, when, when, there, when there's a, a fight going on and there are people standing around cheering it on, listen, I saw plenty of fights in high school, like many of us did. Uh, and I can tell you that girls are just as likely to stand around and watch a fight and cheer it on and laugh and record it on their phone so they can put it on the internet later. I mean, they, they're just as likely to egg it on. I mean, this is something girls do too. Just like many of the things that you saw in the ad and that feminists blame men for, this is something that girls also do, women also do all the time. You know, feminists like to complain about how men talk over women and won't let them uh, uh, speak or let their, won't let them voice their own opinion, their own perspective. Well, you think women don't do that all the time? You think women don't talk over men constantly? As I've said before, in, in, in situations where I, where, you know, in most situations I've been in, when there is a group of people, men and women, standing around or sitting around and having a conversation, it's usually the women who do most of the talking. And if there's anyone involved who's not allowed to get a word in edgewise, it's usually going to be the man who can't, not the women. So I just don't, it just doesn't make any sense. All right. Um, now that we've talked about, about masculinity, uh, let's look at why a lack of masculinity can be harmful. Um, as I said, the problem with men, it's not when they have too much masculinity, it's, it's when they lack it. So let's look at an example. For that, we turn to a man named Duncan Jones, director of uh, various sci-fi films, Hollywood sci-fi films. Um, some good ones, like the, the movie Moon, which I think is one of the best sci-fi movies of the last 10 or 15 years. And also some bad ones. He apparently directed Warcraft. Um, anyway, he decided that Twitter was the right forum to vent his deepest parental frustrations. Uh, and so in a couple of tweets, which have now gone viral, he had this to say. I'll read what he said. He said, um, I have two kids, two and, a half, um, two and a half years and nine months old, respectively. I'll tell you something I never see anyone admit. They are exhausting, frustrating, and life destabilizing. They are rarely fun. Sure, smiles are great, hugs are lovely, but it's hard and not obviously a good choice in life. Um, and then he followed that up with another tweet. He said, this is where people feel compelled to say, I wouldn't change it for the world. But you know, of course I'd reconsider. It's exhausting. It's banal. It's like looking after a dog you can't house train. What it is, is that it is. And they are mine. Hopefully they turn out okay. Uh, well, I hope so too. 
Duncan, but unfortunately, the odds are against them, it seems, if this is your attitude about parenting. What's most concerning about these tweets is, because if you see a tweet like that and it's just kind of lingering out there on its own and nobody's reacting to it, then it's just whatever. But these tweets provoked a lot of reaction. And in the first day or so after they were published, a sizable portion of the responses were entirely supportive and sympathetic to what he was saying. Um, at first, and now it's not like this. It's not like this now. If you look, go look at the tweets now, <clears throat> because sane voices have entered the discussion, so it's it's not the same now. But originally, if you looked at these tweets and then you were to read the thread, I mean, almost all of the top like twenty or thirty tweets were agreeing with what he was saying. Um, people were, parents decided that this was an opportunity for them to come and, and, uh, and join the fray and kind of register their own public complaints about their children. And their complaints were not just the standard sort of, uh, parenting can be tough type complaints, but much more specific and personal. My life is miserable and my kids are awful kinds of complaints. And, and then you had you know, some of the People in the media wrote articles about this. Um, there was an article in Harper's Bazaar about it. And the person who wrote that artic article said that Duncan Jones's comments were very important, accurate, and he should be applauded for offering them. Well, I'm not sure that I can applaud. I'm not sure I can join the standing ovation here. Um, and I say this as a parent of three kids, two five-year-olds, one two-year-old, so I'm in the same basic phase of parenting as uh, Duncan Jones is. And I'll look, yes, I, I will agree that, sure, parenting is a challenge. Um, you don't get a ton of sleep, especially in the beginning. And, and that really, that can take a toll on you. I mean, that, that, the, the sleep thing really does wear you out. That's, that's, a, that's a tough one when you're not getting a lot of sleep. Um, and there's a lot of crying and there's a lot of noise and there's a lot of movement and somebody's always asking for a snack. And when they get to be four or five, there are a million questions a day. I mean, amid, just, there are always questions. Um, and parenting is generally expensive and it, it can be exhausting and it can be anxiety inducing. Um, nobody thinks and nobody would ever claim that parenting is just this nonstop thrill ride or it's or it's luxurious and relaxing and all that you know nobody would ever say that um, but worthwhile things are never that way I can't think of a single worthwhile thing that is completely easy and relaxing and nothing but fun the whole time there's, there's not a single worthwhile thing that is like that so fine I'll I'll give you all that right? But to say that parenting is rarely fun, like looking after a dog, not obviously a good choice. Um, if you see parenting in those terms, there is something wrong with you. So this is not a thing of, well, he's just voicing his opinion and you know that's his opinion. And he's being honest and we should applaud him. No, there's something wrong with it. It's, it's actually not okay to feel that way. Uh, if you do feel that way, then you do, right? I mean... But what I'm saying is you shouldn't accept those feelings. And this is one of the problems with, uh, with people sharing their deepest, most intimate emotions on the internet is that sometimes those feelings and those perspectives and those opinions are not actually okay. And so you shouldn't, number one, you shouldn't be sharing them because it's not anyone's business. This is not the forum for that. So before we even get into the specifics of the comment. This is not the forum for that. Go talk to your therapist, talk to your spouse, talk to your priest. I mean, talk to somebody personally. You don't need to put it on the internet. And the problem is when people have thoughts and feelings like this and they put it on the, the reason why they put it on the internet is because they're looking for other people to chime in and say, oh yeah, I feel that way too. And then all of a sudden this feeling that originally seemed to you to be kind of shameful, now you feel okay with it. Now you're, now you're going to sort of accept it. Um, because you see that, oh, other people feel the same way, so it must not be that bad. If you're sitting around wallowing in misery that parenting is uh, destabling your life and um, you would like to reconsider, those are not feelings that you should just accept 
and, and embrace. Those, those are not good feelings. They come from a character defect in you. And that defect is pretty easy to identify. Selfishness, immaturity, that's where it comes from. I mean, if you rarely have fun, I cannot, how can a person manage to rarely have fun with like a two-year-old? Two-year-olds are, are a blast. And if, you've, if you haven't learned how to, how to have fun with them, it's, it's only because you haven't ha learned how to have fun or to take joy in things that don't revolve completely around you. That's why. But once you've developed the ability to actually look beyond yourself just a little bit and to kind of like push your own needs and desires just slightly towards the back burner, even for a few moments, it becomes extremely easy to have fun with kids, especially young kids. Um, like I said, my son is two years old and the kid is hilarious. He's also a challenge. He's going through his phase right now where he has, he breaks into these temper tantrums randomly and for no apparent reason. So yeah, that's tough. That's not fun. But most of the time, the kid is hilarious. We took him out in the snow yesterday to go sledding and he loved it. I mean, it's just, how can you not have fun in that situation? Unless, again, you demand that every moment of your life center around you. Because, yeah, with a two-year-old, it's not going to be like that. These, these, are, these moments with your kid, when you're having fun with a two-year-old, they're not going to be moments about you. They're going to be moments about the two-year-old. All of these moments, when you're taking the two-year-old out, out to have fun, you're going to be caring for the two-year-old, watching after them, doing things that interest them. And so it's not going to be about you. That's true. But that doesn't mean that you can't have fun doing it. Um. Here's my experience. Kids are the most difficult when you try to relegate them to the background um, because kids don't like being put in the background. Uh, this is one of the reasons why time out or sending a kid to a corner can, can sometimes be an effective form of discipline. Now, for you and me, that would not be an effective punishment because we would say, oh, you want me to just go chill in a corner for an hour? Great. Awesome. But um, kids don't like it because kids don't like to be put. They, they don't like to be put in the background and to have things going on without them. They don't want, they, they can't handle that. So that's why, um, and so when you're trying to do that, that's when it becomes the most challenging. And of course, there are times as parents when you need to be able to put your kids sort of in the background and do things that aren't about them. Like you need to sleep, um, you need to work, uh, you need to sometimes have adult conversations, you need to spend time with your spouse, you need sometimes to watch a movie that isn't about talking animals or princesses. Um, you need all of that, right? You, your whole, you, you, you can't structure literally every single moment of your life around a kid. And when you're trying to have those moments that aren't about them, that's when they can feel especially frustrating, especially burdensome. Um, but I think if you find that your kids are always frustrating and always a burden and rarely fun and generally life destabilizing, that's probably because you're trying to keep them in the background and out of the way pretty much all the time. If you find no joy in parenting at all, it's almost certainly because you've made no effort to actually focus on your kids and invest yourself in them. You're trying to live your life as if they don't exist. And if you try to live a life like that, yes, kids will absolutely destabilize that kind of lifestyle. There's no question about it. So, one quick example of this. Right now, uh, one of our parenting challenges in my house is that my daughter, uh, five years old, refuses to go to bed at night. Okay, this is a very common problem. Many parents have gone through it. And uh, so we'll put her down for bed, and then she'll find a reason to come out of her room and come talk to us like nine or ten times. She keeps coming out of her room, finding a reason. She wants to tell us something. She wants a drink of water. She's got to go to the potty. She's, you know, there are monsters under the bed, this, this and that and this. Um, and so this gets annoying because as a parent, you know, when you put your kids down to bed, you want to kind of clock out, right? You want to punch the time card, clock out, parenting is done for the day. Now you're going to relax, read a book, watch a TV show, spend time with your spouse. Um, you don't want to parent anymore. You want to be done with the parenting for the day, right? When you put the kid down and when they keep coming out and talking to you and asking questions and wanting things, it just... It, it's, a, it's way more annoying than it would be at any other time of the day because in your mind you're saying, no, this is supposed to be me time. This is not you time. This is me time. And now you're intruding on me time. And so even a, even a really basic question or need that you have is going to be 10 times more annoying 
because this is me time. So here's what I found. Um, I found that just a little bit of patience, and I'm not saying that I'm great with patience, okay? I'm not, I'm not a very patient person. I've, I've had to work on this. I've been forced to work on it, and I've not mastered it at all. But a little bit of patience, just a little patience with, with kids, and suddenly this challenge really becomes not a big deal. If you can just, man, a little patience. I'd say like 90% of the problems that parents whine about, and that I whine about too sometimes, just a little patience would solve that problem or at least make it so it doesn't seem like as big of a problem. A little bit of patience. So first of all, I realized that honestly, it's not that big of a deal if she comes out of her room and says something and then goes back into her room. It's like really not a, that huge of a deal. Also, again, with a little bit of patience, I discovered that, okay, uh, part of the reason why this is happening is because she has trouble sleeping at night, which means she's a lot like me. I'm kind of a night owl as well. Uh, and she has very specific needs for sleeping. We discovered she needs it to be very dark. She needs it to be cold. She needs to be wearing certain pajamas. She needs a fan on for the noise. Uh, you know, all these. So we just, you know, over time we discovered, and now we do that when we put her down for bed. And so it's less of a problem. Now she still comes out, but it's less of a problem. And how much of a problem was it really in the first place is the question. And that's the thing about having young kids is that I realize that even the things that are super annoying and frustrating now I realize, and, ki and parents with older kids, they say this all the time, and I, and I know that even though I haven't experienced it, I know that what they're saying is true. That even these things that are annoying and frustrating now, when my kids are older, I will miss almost all of it. I know that I will. Uh, I'll probably miss it terribly. I mean, there will come a time when my daughter is not going to come out of her room and ask me to carry her back down to her room and, and tuck her in. Like, that's going to, the time's going to come when she has no interest in that. And, um, and that's going to be, it's going to be sad when that phase is gone and over. So part of this with parenting, I think, is just, um, you know, it's just choosing how to think about these sorts of things. There are some parenting challenges which are really just difficulties and hardships. And so all you can do is get through them. There's no, you know, there's, there's no way around it. There's no rethinking it. There's no thinking of it differently. Uh, there are some things you go through as a parent that you definitely will not miss, right? But um, like not getting any sleep when you have a newborn. That's one of the, you're never going to miss that. That's, just, it, that's a, just a hard thing. But a lot of the stuff, if we just thought of it differently, we would see it as a blessing, as an, as an opportunity for, for joy and, and for fun. G.K. Chesterton said that, um, an inconvenience is just an adventure wrongly considered. And I think that that's, that's true for a lot of parenting. Parenting, it kind of sums up a lot, of, a lot of what parenting is. David Foster Wallace, in a famous commencement speech he gave, um, talks about how many of the situations that we find annoying and, and difficult in life, he wasn't talking about parenting, but it goes for parenting too, that many of those situations, if we just thought about them differently, had a different attitude about them, we would suddenly see the, and this is the, these are the words he used, we would see these moments as not only meaningful, but sacred. And I think he's right about that. So I'm not saying that we should be focused 100% on our kids all the time. You know, they need to know the, the world doesn't revolve around them too. But, but it also doesn't revolve around us as parents. And when I hear from guys like Duncan Jones, what it sounds like is he wants the world to revolve around him. And kids, they really do think the world revolves around them, but they have an excuse to feel that. A two-year-old thinks that. There's no way a two-year-old isn't going to think that because they have no concept of the world outside of themselves. So they're allowed to think that way. Um, you're not. You're an adult. You should know better. And here's the thing. That there's not enough room in the house for all, for, for all of us to be kids. Like, someone's got to be the adult in the situation. Sometimes as an adult, we have to, you know, we, that doesn't mean, uh, we can have fun acting like kids with our kids sometimes, having fun with them. But what I mean is, we can't have the attitude and the maturity of children. Someone's got to be an adult. Um, finally, let's see, do we have time for this? I guess so. Um, yeah, I just, I just wanted to mention this. Yesterday, Donald Trump had the uh, Clemson football team over to the White House. Um, 
but he couldn't get the normal catering service because of the shutdown. So he provided this gorgeous, classy spread of McDonald's food. I don't know if you saw this picture. Let's take a look at the picture of the feast right now. Now, of course, people found a reason to be upset about this. I mean, he's got these silver platters filled with Big Macs and, uh, and uh, fish fillets and french fries and chicken nuggets. He, it, apparently there was pizza too. He, he, he provided Burger King as well, in case you were a Burger King guy, not a McDonald's guy. Um, people found a reason to be upset about it because they always find a reason, especially as it pertains to Donald Trump. But really, I mean, first of all, I have long suggested that McDonald's should have a buffet restaurant. There should be, there should be Mick buffets and they should look exactly like this feast. So people have always called me crazy for, but now you can look at this and now you see what I'm saying, right? I mean, that would be great. There'd be a great kind. And I'm talking about a fancy, like, like what Donald Trump did a fancy Mick buffet um, so that you could go there for your wedding anniversary or, you, you know, a first date. You really want to impress a girl, bring her to the McDonald's buffet. And you could say to her, hey, have two Big Macs if you want. Um, but secondly, wh- what, what man, what football player, what American wouldn't love to be presented with a silver platter filled with Big Mac and fish fillets? I mean, anyone would love that. I have, in my time, been to many fancy banquet, banquet type things, and I've had a lot of fancy banquet food, and I can't think of a single one of those events that would not have been vastly improved by Big Macs. Um, I actually think that the typical fancy banquet food is, is usually really disappointing. The chicken tastes like rubber, the beef is always overcooked. Um, They get way too fancy. They try way too hard. Portions aren't big enough. I would just take a Big Mac. So I actually think, in all seriousness, this is, although the left is making fun of him for it, of course, I think this is probably the most endearing thing that Trump has ever done. And if I ever went to visit um, Donald Trump for some sort of fancy lunch and McDonald's was not served, I would be thoroughly disappointed. This is exactly what I would expect, and I would be thrilled by it. All right, we'll leave it there. Have a great day, everybody. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Godspeed.